together. So yes, it's it's quite this a hard act to follow on from um, Callum and Andrew. I was just thinking, and I'm actually also reflecting on how great it was that we heard from you first, because in a way the presentation that we're giving might feel a little bit dry because we're we're talking about kind of numbers and cases, and I just think it's really important. Um, that we've heard your stories and that we which we always try to do when we research but to remember mm. that there are real every sort of every single case that we've had reported to us in our surveillance study is it is a child or a young person and a family and we they have a story you. like that and so I, I think it's um well, I hope this doesn't sound too horribly dry after hearing about your personal experiences but I guess what we're we're trying to do is sort of we're stepping back a bit and talking mm. about what we've learned at a population level but yeah a, fantastic to hear from you guys and I feel I climbed one Monroe once and that was it was extremely difficult <laughs> and I yes haven't had Sydenham's career or anything so I'm um, also very confident you can climb Everest but I'll move on and get on to what we're going to talk yeah. about so Wana and I are going to talk about I suppose our UK experience of researching Sydenham's career and we're kind of speaking on behalf of a whole range of people, many of whom are in the in the room today who've kind of supported this. Um, so we are going to talk about our, our our findings, but just to start off with, give a bit of the context of the project and actually probably um, Nadine and Michael and others and um, Andrew can probably do this better than we can because we came in after things that kicked off a bit. Um, but as the story is already being told, um, some of the ideas for this research came following the, the cluster of Sydenham's cases. Um, and again, I, maybe I, I don't like to say cases because it's children yes. and families, isn't it? But it's often the term that we use in research and epidemiology. So I hope you'll ex excuse me using that. Um, and some of the only other research that had been done in terms of looking at how common or, or rare Sydenham's might be was um, done by Professor Mary King's um, team in the Republic, well, in Ireland, which was 2004 to 2014. And they did a retrospective study. And the title of their study was Sydenham's career is, is not gone, um, but it's perhaps forgotten, um, finding quite low levels of awareness and uncertainty about the best kind of treatment. So. Together, we sort of developed a partnership of researchers um, with the Sydenham's Career Association to try and address some of these questions about what's currently going on in the UK and Republic of Ireland in terms of, of Sydenham's. And we've had a lot of support and funding both from the Sydenham's Career Association here today, but also from the British Association for Childhood Disability and the British Medical Association, all of whom have, have given us funds to carry out our, our surveillance research. So, um, so what we all worked together to do was to develop a surveillance study and I suppose you might say there are a lot of questions that you could ask about Sydenham's and a lot of research to be done so why in this case a surveillance study and I think the value of that is that you can establish the pattern and presentation of a rare condition um, which is really important you can describe what's currently going on in terms of of clinical practice and through follow up, hopefully you can investigate outcomes and what happens to children and young people, which can then be really valuable information for families. And the other thing about surveillance studies is that they often have a, a kind of a secondary effect of raising awareness amongst clinicians because they're being asked to fill in cards every month or getting information and it, it just might help them become more aware of the condition through the process of participating in surveillance as well as when we talk about our own results. And I've just touched on this, but a few more ways on how we use surveillance studies is they can help us establish population estimates of exactly how rare or common something is. Um, there was the idea that at one stage that Sydenham's was a thing of the past, but we know that it certainly mm. isn't. Um, as I said, kind of surveillance can help to provide better information for families about what to expect and the experiences of other children and young people who have had the condition. And importantly, clinicians need to know in sort of modern times, how does Sydenham's career present? What are the most common features and what information they can give to families? And when we think about services like paediatric neurology or cardiology or child and adolescent psychiatry, we need information on the needs of, of children with Sydenham so that we can plan and design services. 
And in terms of what, describing sort of variations in practice and management, that can help us identify whether we need to develop more guidance or consensus and also identify further unanswered questions and uncertainties for further research. And there's a lot of those. Mm. Um, Wani, well, anything to add to that or? Um, oh, just to say, in a, yeah. in a way, that's what the uh, the BBSU and CAPS were, were designed for in yes. the first place. For uh, I better, I, I think in a way, um, the title of the paper, Not Gone But Perhaps Forgotten, it's a better way to think of what they call rare conditions. Mm. Um, and, and also, reflecting back on our experience of uh, clinical practice, um, that we we are all trained in our times and we 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 perhaps have not seen mm. uh, conditions. I certainly, when I first heard about the Sinus Korea project, I had to go back and, and look it up yes. because I have not seen um, a, a child or young person with this condition, which is perhaps telling and reflects to what we'll be talking about later on in terms of the caps that I'm not the only one, <laughs> you know, I did, not the only uh, child psychiatrist have not seen her during training or practice as a consultant later on. So I think it's, it's one of the great thing about the surveyors and bring that forward. And it's one thing that I remember from my medical training. It, it, you can't recognize something unless you've seen it before, unless you know about it. So if you, if you don't think about it, you are not going to recognize it. So I think that that's, that that's the, the fantastic opportunity to run surveillance studies is that you bring that into people's minds. That That's the hope, I think, with, with, with the studies. Exactly. Thank you, Anna. And yes, I remember I think I had to go and look. Oh, I found some videos and to mm, see yeah. how it presents so I could understand more about yeah. it. I hadn't, I'd only done a bit of training in child and adolescent psychiatry, mm. but also never seen it. And so I think that's why the videos that Adrian and others are, are making are mm. also so valuable. Um, and Wana mentioned BPSU and CAPS, which are the surveillance systems, which some of you might be very familiar with, but we'll say a little bit more yeah. about those in a moment. So this was the aim of our study, and I think this, this again, this sounds slightly, um, slightly dry, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. But the aim was to conduct the first prospective surveillance study of Sydenham's in the UK and Republic of Ireland, and we wanted to describe the current paediatric and child psychiatric service-related incidents, presentation and management in children and young people aged 0 to 16. So again, that sounds, it does sound very dry. Basically, it was about understanding more about um, the, I suppose the incidents of new cases, um, the pattern of them presenting and, and how they present in terms of modern day synonyms and understand more about, about practice and what happens to those cases, those children, sorry. And these were our research questions. So we wanted to look at the service related incidents to paediatrics. So by this, we just simply mean um, Num the number of new cases that are being seen by paediatricians in mm. age 0 to 16 in the UK and Republic of Ireland, and then the psychiatric service related incidents, which would be um, children and young people presenting to child and adolescent psychiatrists or CAM services mm. in the UK as well. Um, CAPS is also Ireland, isn't it? Exactly. Yes, CAPS, yeah, UK and ROI. And the thing to say about that is that it was slightly different in that we were interested in any children and young people um, coming in contact with CAMS, whereas for paediatricians it was new cases. But Warner will say a little bit yeah. more about that in a moment. And again, we were interested in finding out sort of how are these children and young people presenting? What are, what are the symptoms they have when they come into contact with services? And what's the current clinical practice in terms of investigations, management and referral? So we already touched on some of the things around um, immunotherapy, antibiotics and, you know, what, what are children and young people being prescribed? How long are they taking it? So I'll move on to one who's going to yeah. talk a bit about the method. Yeah. Um, so we, we uh, um, used um, the the, um, the the BPSU and the CAPS that they're, they're already um, running studies um, similar methodology in terms of conditions that we don't see often um, in clinical practice. Um, so in a way, um, that, as I said, that that's what um, this um, they were designed for. 
um, and it it was a fantastic opportunity um, to have both on board so we can run a parallel surveillance. Um, so the, the BBC is the paediatric and the council is the, the child psychiatry. Um, I, I, I tend to think of them as like the sisters, <laughs> the two sisters working uh, together. The timing wasn't quite the same, uh, very much related to, to practicalities as well as planning ahead in terms of the follow ups. Uh, because some of them um, were thinking of Chilean people presenting to a pediatrician for the first time. Um, but the, the CAMS, uh, which is kind of the mental health presentation, the psychiatric presentation, would often come later on. So they don't exactly match in terms of the timing, but we wanted to cover uh, as much as we can cover. So um, one run from the November 2018 to November 2020 and CAMS, um, that was May 2019, December 2020. Okay. Um, the I I won't go into that much detail. I'm, I'm happy. No, we're both happy to, to answer questions. But um, basically, they 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 do a very similar thing. Um, they both BBSC and CAB send reporting cards uh, to the registered pediatric and child psychiatrist. Um, so it's nationwide, um, and this is basically just to ask whether you have, as a clinician, have seen a child or young person presenting with suspected or confirmed condition, um, Sinem's Korean in this case, and then the cards get returned. This is just to notify and it, it all the, um, every single time you have such a card, these days electronic, it used to be on a paper format, is to notify if you have or have not seen um, so that we don't miss out. Uh, we're not assuming that we have not seen from a, uh, a clinician means they have not seen a case. We want them to say, yes, I have or I haven't. Um, and that's to check whether actually people receive the cards. So it, the, the response of uh, that is really, really important. And that's how we check. And I'll, I'll explain because with, with the caps, there was a time when that the response rate was, wasn't great. Um, and once somebody says, yes, I have seen a case, then we ask them for more information for the questionnaires. Um, that there is, um, I said, the National Health Service, if I'm sorry, that they, they receive the notifications. Um, and then when the questionnaires get returned, obviously that there is a bit of a process around um, anonymizing the data so that the research team receives only the data they need to see um, and that obviously being securely stored. So that's the research data compared to other bits that we don't have to know. Um, the case definitions are a slightly different as Thomas has already touched on. Uh, so obviously with, with the pediatricians, this was the first time they have seen a child young person with possible syndrome's career uh, or sometimes um, if it was confirmed. So that was the first episode. Um, it's frequently clinical diagnosis. So although we ask about laboratory, it does not have to be confirmed. So we don't miss out. Um, and the CAPS, um, we, we had, a, I remember, a long conversation, lots of debates and how we can make it clear for clinicians, but we don't want to miss on cases on young people being reported. Um, and how services work differently in terms of pediatrics compared to uh, psychiatry slash mental health service. Um, so we, we want, um, we, we've asked uh, psychiatrists to, reform, to report whether they have or have not seen um, a young person, child young person um, with suspect or confirmed diagnosis of sinus presenting to them, to the service for the first time, first time within that current episode of care. This is, again, it, it's very much service related, but we, we had long debates of how to phrase it in a way that it's clear for clinicians what they want them to report. And we don't miss out on any child young person that at some point has been referred to a psychiatrist or camps. And I, I stress that out because um, you will see later on, um, it's it's been to us, I think, as researchers, a little bit disappointing <laughs> in terms of in terms of caps. But it might be that there is a lesson to be learned from that. As, um, I remember Tamsin Ford was um, always says, you know, negative findings are still findings. Yeah. So. <laughs> 
Um, the, the question of content, again, it's a lot of details around it. Um, and of course, what BPSU does very much uh, in terms of the, the pediatric aspect, we want an onset, severity, symptoms, or the history, the investigations, management, referrals, impact functions, lots of details. Um, and hopefully everything, and we try, we try to cover lots of material, um, also being aware of clinicians' time, but it was it was very important for us um, because um, I think that that's that's the bit that we can, um, uh, the, the for families, for children, young people, and for other clinicians to know, not just numbers. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, so, yes. Okay. So just moving on to some of our findings. So. Also to say that these are currently submitted for review, um, hopefully will be published, but at the moment are unpublished. So I've just put on the slide the title of the paper that we hope to publish from these. Um, so, I mean, these findings won't change, but they will mm. sort of be the way they're framed might do slightly. So these are our findings from our surveillance with the British Paediatric Surveillance Unit over that two years of, of surveillance. And basically what we see here is that we had 72 reports from paediatricians, some of which turned out to not be eligible when we got the questionnaires back. It either wasn't a first episode of mm. Sydenham's um, or actually when it came through it, it wasn't Sydenham's. Some clinicians um, reported duplicate cases to us, maybe two different paediatricians who might have seen the child first and then seen them subsequently, so we excluded those. And we did have um, 15 that we weren't able to follow up and get questionnaires back from. That's not at all uncommon with research and is actually quite a decent response rate but obviously it would be yeah. be nice to have got questionnaires back from everybody but sometimes this just happens you know uh, clinicians move on or yeah. very busy or can't find the, the records of that child um, so what we've ended up with is having in total um, 43 children or young people, um, 0 to 16, with either suspected or, or confirmed Sydenham's career that were reported to us and on this next slide we have sort of done a bit of work in sort of turning these into estimates of mm -hmm. incidents in a population because that's normally how we would present things in epidemiology but these of course do look like very small and perhaps not particularly meaningful numbers mm -hmm. to people when we talk about 0.16 mm -hmm. per 100,000 children aged 0 to 16 per year um so I, I will we can move on just to think about what that actually mm -hmm. means but also to add and this is all in the paper that we can also assume that a certain number or we can try assuming that a certain proportion of those that we couldn't follow up mm. may also have had Sydenham's career actually and that does slightly increase our incidence estimate um, but I suppose if you think about this in a population and again it goes back to the number that we, we had is that you know we we do think based on the numbers we had reported if that were to happen every year we would see you know 20 to 30 children roughly age mm -hmm. 0 to 16 in the UK might develop Sydenham's career and be presenting to paediatricians. But there are lots of reasons why this isn't an mm. this isn't an estimate of all cases. Some might not be seen by a paediatrician, some might not recognise Sydenham's. Some paediatricians, for example, if you might be seen by a, um, a doctor who's not a consultant or not currently reporting to the BPSU and the consultant that does isn't aware, mm. that won't be picked up. And I think the other important thing to say is that this is new or incident cases. So we're cases, so we're not including children and young people um, who might be presenting to a paediatrician with a, you know, a recurrent mm. as, as in Callum's story. So, and I think the other thing to say is that these sort of estimates of incidents seem to us to be sort of roughly in line with um, Professor Mary King's mm. from the study that she did of case notes in, in Ireland some years ago. So it, you know, we're coming up with fairly mm. consistent yeah. estimates in this sense of um, paediatric presentations. Mm. Um, so in terms of the characteristics of um, the children um, that were, were presenting to paediatrics, so there was a mean age of, of 9.4, a range of 4 to 16, our upper limit was 16, so that obviously makes sense. Um, the majority were, were, were girls um, and the majority were from a white ethnic background. Um, the majority of cases that we had reported or children reported were from England, um, with fewer from Wales, Scotland or Northern Ireland, but that's probably roughly proportional actually. 
when you think about population sizes. And most of the children reported to us were reported by um, consultant general paediatricians, but a third were reported to us by consultant paediatric uh, neurologists. But of course, they may have been seen and quite likely may have been seen mm. by multiple different types of paediatric consultant over their journey. But these are the ones that actually reported to us. And this is maybe a little bit of a, a busy slide. And again, it, there's more details in our paper, but this sort of shows the most common sort of features that children were presenting to the paediatrician with so that the paediatrician reported. Obviously, or hopefully, obviously, all of the children had career because that was mm. the, the, the key feature yes. of Sydenham's career. Um, and the majority were presenting with what the paediatrician characterised as moderate career um, with a few with very severe career and some with milder career. Um, so the most common features overall were, as you might expect, some neurological features. So the, the vast majority having a loss of those fine motor skills or disturbance in their gait or their walking mm -hmm. or slurred speech or dysarthria. So those are the most three most common features overall, but also sort of a majority also experiencing some kind of um, problems with muscles in terms of weakness, mm -hmm. uh, loss of mus muscle tone or motor impersistence was another common presenting feature. Uh, we were, of course, very interested in the kind of emotional and behavioural um, neuropsychiatric mm -hmm. symptoms that children might present with and emotional ability. So those rapid kind of changes of, of mood um, were again very common, um, more than three quarters of, of children presenting with that and over half presenting with some kind mm -hmm. of anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, also inattention or deficits in attention also common as were um, tics too. Mm -hmm. um, less common things at presentation were obsessive compulsive symptoms, depressive um, symptoms, um, hyperactivity. But again, these were at the time that they were presenting mm -hmm. to the paediatrician. So later on, that might have changed. And interestingly, um, so other features of rheumatic fever other than sort of the mm -hmm. career and the, well, the symptoms um, were very rare. Um, in this mm. particular sample, although though some children did have carditis at the time mm. of presenting. And that's probably something for more for paediatric cardiologists or other to comment on. It feels mm. slightly outside my field, okay. but um, Juana, do you yeah. want to come in on no, that? Just one thing to add, because reflecting when I was looking yeah. at results, um, that sometimes um, that's what you know, the PGA of research is flagging up mm. um, some um, aspects of a condition that were not necessarily included in, in the diagnostic criteria. Um, so one one comparison in my mind when we used to think of um, you know, autism of the spectrum conditions um, and sensory processing difficulties wasn't part of it, mm. and now it is. So because when I've looked at that, I think, oh, it, 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 yes, the loss of fine models, because I expected that difficulties with walking and you know, joint problems, everything I expected. But actually, the emotional ability is very high. Mm -hmm. It's almost as high as, as the motor difficulties. Yeah. And uh, I'm thinking I wanted to go back and looking at, at the diagnostic criteria, because yeah. maybe that should be uh, in there um, if, if it's that common. Mm -hmm. um, and it. it Maybe that that's something to look into because I I don't know mm -hmm. I was told my ignorance yeah. I don't know what that's that's what as as for the first thing to mention it as emotional behavior because I've expected hyperactivity of ticks so I I was more familiar with those mm -hmm. um, but problems in terms of in that kind of rapid change in order somebody become easily tearful um, I I tend to see that in my practice quite a lot but I not necessarily um, for young people with neurological or mm -hmm. neuropsychiatric conditions um, so that that is the first thought I had. It's, it's similar to others and something that should be included in the diagnostic criteria. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, yeah. Juana, that you, you pointed out that it was one of the most common yes. um, yeah. things that, that the children presented yeah. with. Um, after first, those, like, I didn't expect yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, after those, um, after those neurological symptoms. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, th I think I suppose one caveat is, I suppose, how comfortable the paediatricians felt mm. identifying and putting a tick in the yeah. box against some of the others like hyperactivity or, yeah. or obsessive compulsive symptoms yeah. or yeah. inattention. But I think it's it's really interesting yeah, yeah. And, and something yeah. to think about when we think about how we characterise how does yes. 
how does symptoms what are yeah. you likely to see yeah um i mean it does stress the importance of of joint working and, and having uh clinics where you, you also have a pediatrician and a psychiatrist working together so that is on psychiatry i can't stress it enough and i work in a service when we are fortunate to have one <laughs> um but it doesn't happen everywhere so maybe that that's again something that should happen <laughs> yeah lots, to, lots yeah, of lots, recommendations lots of shop, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um just yeah moving and this again this sounds very dry this impact on activity mm. of daily living and it may it makes me think back to um what Callum was talking about mm. about his yeah. experience and um I mean we, we included um something called Oh, goodness, it's the UMFG and it's a university, had, uh, I think it's a Brazilian university, but I'm going to embarrass myself by attempting to pronounce it, oh, but sorry. we used, we did use a rating scale to ask um, paediatricians to kind of rate impact and functioning in a number of domains, um, hygiene, handwriting, dressing, speech, walking, using knife and fork, and um, half of children had what was rated a severe impairment due to their career on at least one of those domains. So I think that just shows us probably not as well as Callum's story, but mm -hmm. does, you know, show us the impact that that can have. Yeah. Um, so uh, just moving on to, I think this is probably the final slide on the findings. Um, and I haven't given a lot of detail here. There is some more detail in the paper, but it's it's quite a small sample really to mm. describe in a lot of detail but what we can say is the vast majority almost all uh were prescribed antibiotics which is obviously positive but there were certainly different antibiotic regimes in use being reported by paediatricians other treatments used included the symptomatic treatment of korea with say with anticonvulsants mm. probably such as epilim or neuroleptics um, over a quarter had some kind of immunomodulatory treatment, 16% um, prescribed prednisolone or another steroid and 12% having an intravenous mm -hmm. immunoglobulin. And in terms of the other agencies or professionals that might be involved, around half of children, um, and again, more referrals might be made later because this was at the point of presentation, uh, were referred to occupational therapy or physiotherapy and 14% to clinical psychology or neuropsychology. I don't think we had very many where they reported involvement of educational psychology at that stage, but again, it's early stages and very few. I don't like to give exact numbers here because we have a small sample and we, we've just being a bit careful, yeah. um, fewer than five had a referral to CAMS and, and Wana will mm. talk in just yeah. a moment about, about the CAMS actually. In fact, I think that's probably is our next slide. So it <laughs> over is. to you, yes. Wana. Yeah. And it is interesting because on the BPSU um, side uh, of the study, we knew that some children as, as Tamsi was saying, were referred to child and adolescent mental health services. Um, when um, we, we ran the CAPS study, again, as I um, said earlier, very similar methodology with that, that difference between the case definition and the questionnaires, um, we, because we wanted to know about you know, the children that we were presenting to um, HR psychiatrists, but, um, that kind of the first time. Um, and uh, I mean, that we can hypothesize um, there is no clear uh, straightforward explanation why we haven't had any reports um, that was an 18 month reporting period and despite all the efforts in terms of um, tracing making sure that we we haven't missed anyone out um, and we, we haven't had any reports from CAPS. Um, so at, again, as I was saying with, with um, Tamsin Ford, always highlighting that um, you shouldn't despair, that you, you take this as a positive and think of uh, what um, are the implications of the, the negative findings are still findings. Um, its explanation, its implication, as well as um, how we, uh, what sort of recommendations we could make research as well as clinical. Um, it's very easy many times to say, well, another research study, but that's it, it's how doable that is. Um, so I think um, in, in terms of our thoughts, um, so the making sense of the, the negative findings, um, as I said, the, the, we talked about the, the um, emotional behavioural difficulties, the, that emotional ability being quite high and, and quite common. Um, 
the the way to think about the pathway methodology methodology issues. You know, there was a time on those a lot of response rate from from CAS, but that was time limited. Um, could it be that children, people um, that also had emotional behavior difficulties were seen by other clinicians um, and thinking of, of the service I work in of a like pediatric psychology um, or maybe being referred to camps, they weren't seen by a child psychiatrist. Unfortunately, CAPS only covers doctors. <laughs> um, um, the the consultant psychiatrists who are registered with CAPS, so they don't cover every single other CAMS clinician. Um, and it could be that there were many teams within CAMS or CAMS clinicians that are not registered with CAPS. And of course, we won't hear about them. Um, some CAP services tend to be quite small. Um, so if, if there is a case discussed, you hear about it. Even if you haven't seen the child directly, you would hear about the young person being talked in a, uh, in a multidisciplinary team meeting. Um, so it's it, there is that possibility that the case is worsening within CAMS, but the psychiatrists weren't aware. Um, we are left with the question, is children who were not referred to camps so were not seen by psychiatrists, was this appropriate or not? Um, and how we, how we can ensure, um, can make efforts um, that the children um, have the support they, they, they need, not necessarily uh, from a, a, a by a psychiatrist, but within a mental health service. So could that be in psychology? Could that be within the wider CAM service? So we are left with questions uh, at the end of the study, which is not very comfortable for, for <laughs> researchers like to have answers to questions, not to end up with more questions that you started with. Um, but we'd like to hear uh, people's thoughts and the hope with, um, with this um, um, event and with the paper. Um, that, uh, that this is a starting point um, and it's, it's in a way might be a good thing to have those questions in mind to raise awareness and um, and with uh, colleagues reading the paper with psychology the paper thinking mm, have I missed something in my own practice okay um I think yeah, we, we, we tried to put together a few thoughts and there'll be more detail in the paper about um, not gone but perhaps forgotten and we're trying to get rid of the perhaps forgotten bit <laughs> um, so that we can raise awareness. Um, it would be fantastic to reach that consensus uh, in terms of the, the clinical management and the support for, for children and for the families. Um, we, we've mentioned that kind of confusion between the pans and the pandas, which many of us here will be thinking, mm, what is exactly the difference between? <laughs> um, and um, yeah, that the distinction is important clinically because of the, the, the treatment and the trajectory in, in, in recovery afterwards. Um, but yeah, we said that there is this good work done in, in both um areas it, it it's, it's important to bear in mind the difference mm. but yes it, it is a work in progress and with many of us um in clinic thinking mm, have i have i got that right yeah and i think we did wonder whether any of that might have influenced reporting as yeah. well didn't yeah. it? possibly yeah right shall uh, i do yeah. what we <laughs> um, so in terms of what's next, we've got um, the publication of the study findings um, more formally, and we also have um, a t we also and we didn't particularly talk about this because mm -hmm. we haven't collated the findings yet. But we did also do twelve month and twenty four month follow ups, going back to the paediatricians to ask how the children were doing, mm -hmm. and I think that's actually one of the most interesting things, really answering that question about one year and two year outcomes mm -hmm. and. I mean, I think you can say that we haven't had obviously such a good response to that because mm. you're trying to track people down later on. In general, a lot of the the children seem to have had um, quite a good resolution um, mm. to to what's been happening with them in terms of their difficulties. But we need to look at that in a lot more detail. So I don't want to say too much about it, but we mm. are we are currently we've just got um, a student who's going to come and work with us to analyse that. And I think um, Mike Hare and others are going to talk about the sort of the Delphi project 
later on actually but one of the things coming from this is an international collaboration mm. thinking about um, consensus and development and yeah also interested one has talked about some other things around how we support children mm. better um, but obviously keen to hear other ideas or feedback about what's next so thank you everybody <laughs> so, so reflecting on, on Callum's story it yeah. would be fantastic but we are yeah. limited with methodology to have a longer follow-up yeah it would um because that that um the the optimism the hope uh that that positive approach it, it's so important mm -hmm. for, for someone's recovery yeah. Um, so by by knowing those kind of stories, and obviously with the charity, that that's that's a fantastic piece of work. So, so people know, yes, the recovery is happening. Yeah. That I can look forward to the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, it would be great for us as a, as a researcher to be able to have that data on five later on, ten, ten yeah. years later on. That would be great. It's true. It did make me think listening to yeah. Callum that our two year follow up is is very short. But it's it's just one of those the difficulties yeah. of, of following people up effectively mm. um and it also made me think that it should be interesting to know what um i suppose what what callum identifies as a, the most important yes. research priority yeah, i know that's yeah, discussions yeah. that the sca do have but yeah. anyway thank you we'll, we'll stop thank happy you. to take any questions thank you both that was wonderful um any questions Michael? I thought I'd kick off because I read in The Guardian three days ago, a paper I don't always read, um, that rheumatic fever, which of course is very much part of the story of Sydenham's career, they're, they're highly connected. According to The Guardian, rheumatic fever is a disease of severe social deprivation found mainly in the third world. Would you be able to explain whether your findings tell us anything about that? Sadly not, other than that's not clearly not the case, <laughs> that it's only found in the th third world. Um, I think it's, it is interesting in terms of sort of the distribution of cases yeah. that, that we've seen, but we didn't collect sort of information about where people mm. were living or their mm. social circumstances, unfortunately. Um, I just wonder what 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 you would reflect on that, Michael. What your reaction was to that article? Well, my reaction was I wanted to write a letter to the Guardian. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think they'd publish it. Um, Maybe we the, should. <laughs> the medical editor could certainly do with a bit of information. I, I suspect just introducing them to Andrew and Callum would be a start. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what we found in Glasgow was that it made no difference really what mm. people's background was. Um, and uh, I think it's unfortunate still that, you know, people see rheumatic fever and Sydney's career as something that doesn't happen here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, hopefully your paper, when it comes out and the Italian work that's come out, mm -hmm. will, will help people see that differently. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Michael. Any other questions, Adrian? Hi, thanks. Thanks, Tanzan and Rana. Um, of course, the, the Glasgow story was of a, a cluster. And um, I thought it was interesting that in the, 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 the duration of your surveillance study, it didn't really look like there were any clusters. And of course, the reason it's better known as a disease in, in areas of social deprivation is because of the, the fact that it's an infection that's spread by, by close contacts and poor hygiene. So. Um, it's um yeah it's it, it's just a different kind of situation isn't it and uh, and i know dr garoni is going to speak more about the data in italy so look forward to hearing it and i think adrian you did that helpful map didn't you of glasgow because glasgow is such a, a a large city and actually there wasn't there was there was there wasn't really any correlation between where the cases had, had come from had they no, that's right. And and mm -hmm. even just looking at the, the, the people who've joined our Facebook group from all around the world, it, again, it, it's just mm -hmm. scattered around. It, 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 mm -hmm. it doesn't look like there's clear um, outbreaks. But of course, there's, you've just told us there's a case in the UK probably every 
two to three weeks and we don't so we're not hearing as a charity we're not hearing about most of the cases still which is mm. which is a shame because I, I don't believe it's for lack of the need for support and information mm. um and uh yeah going forward it, it, it I, th I think there will be clusters um in the future and and it would be nice to know more about them mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we were surprised because, well, certainly I had expected to see clusters, but over that two years, no evidence of them, obviously quite small. And it's sometimes, you know, in that time frame, it perhaps was just by by chance that that didn't happen, but they were very distributed. And the other thing was the reporting was fairly even. Mm -hmm. we, we would get occasionally a few come in at once, but generally the reporting over the course of the year was fairly even, which also yeah. surprised me. And actually during COVID as well, because one interesting thing was that our, the last six months or so of our surveillance was during COVID. And mm. we'd expected maybe not to see, I don't know, I suppose I'd hypothesise we might not see any or very few during that time mm. if, if being isolated might have made that kind of difference but again it was quite quite steady mm -hmm. but it, i think it's difficult to extrapolate on a yes. quite a small sample so mm -hmm. we, we may well see clusters mm -hmm. in the future as adrian says i think in mm -hmm. relation to covid it might have been too early yeah i mean we certainly and it's not just uh within camps yeah uh, we see a, a bit of a comeback in yeah. some conditions or a sharp rise um in in presentations yeah. uh including ticks for yeah. instance, and in terms of uh, I know the coming back of of some um, conditions that they've been I say rare mm. uh, for some time, so I don't know if it, if we could run the study again that would be really interesting yeah. because it, I've been you know, seeing whether there has been any increase or any clusters now. So, yeah, more questions than answers. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's always the case, isn't it? <laughs> But I think it was lovely that you put the positive spin on it and that Times and Forward said, you know, because the questions and then and, and the more questions, it's it's all positive. I think it's really interesting, the response from CAMS, and I, I really do. And I think that is a much bigger question for what is happening with just physical illness in general within CAMS and what's happening to the nature of CAMS. So I think it's very exciting for us who work in CAMS to be thinking actually some of this work is going to penetrate and hopefully change the st structures because at the minute CAMS just seems to be firefighting waiting lists um, or urgent need. Um, so hopefully, I'm hoping and, and very passionate that some positive will come from this work for, for that relationship to, I suppose, re-engage, because it's been there in the past, mm. but between paediatrics and psychiatry and services from primary yeah. care to CAMS, yeah. So in a way, this is almost an exemplar, isn't it? Yeah. Because there are yeah. other conditions that this applies to, or well, many Absolutely. of them, but it's it's yeah. an example. So yeah, yeah, and a really good one. That's lovely. Well, thank you both so very much.